Good afternoon. Parents, relatives, friends, and graduates. Welcome to Stanford University's 128th commencement exercises and to the diploma ceremony of the Program in International Relations. My name is Michael Toms. I'm a professor of political science and the director of the International Relations Program. We are all very proud of what our international relations graduates have achieved. They have studied the most difficult challenges facing our world, including war, human rights, pollution, poverty, and the governance of the global economy. They have investigated problems from many angles by completing an interdisciplinary curriculum that combines political science, history, economics, statistics, and many other fields. All of our majors have studied abroad and attained proficiency in a foreign language. They are graduating with the knowledge and tools that will help them achieve excellence in their future careers. I am very pleased to join you today as we honor our graduates. Today's ceremony will have three parts. First, Professor Colin Call will deliver the keynote address. Second, two graduating seniors, Audrey Wynn and Lloyd Lyle, will reflect on their time at Stanford. And finally, Drs. Erica Gould and Robert Rakove will read the names of the graduates, and Professor Stephen Stedman will present the diplomas. I will introduce each of these participants at the appropriate moment in the ceremony. Let me begin by introducing our keynote speaker, Professor Colin Call. And, uh, Professor Call is the co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. He is also the Stephen C. Hazy Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and a professor by courtesy of political science. Before coming to Stanford in 2018, he held professorships at the University of Minnesota and at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Professor Call has researched a wide range of topics, including civil and ethnic conflict, insurgency and counterinsurgency, and nuclear proliferation. He has also written extensively on contemporary US foreign and defense policy with a particular focus on the Middle East, his current research includes a book project examining the role of the Middle East in American understanding of grand strategy since 9-11. Professor Call has also worked at the highest levels of government on major foreign policy and national security challenges. From 2009 to 2011, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East at the Pentagon. There, he received from Secretary Gates, the Secretary of Defense Medal for Outstanding Public Service. Professor Call returned to government in 2014 to become Deputy Assistant to the President and National Security Advisor to the Vice President. For more than two years, he advised President Obama and Vice President Biden on all matters related to U.S. foreign policy and national security affairs. Professor Call grew up in Richmond, California, and tells me that he's happy to be back here in California. He earned a BA in political science from the University of Michigan and a PhD in political science from Columbia University. We've actually known each other since high school when we met on the debate circuit, so I can tell you from firsthand experience that he is a brilliant debater and public speaker, so you're in for quite a treat today with his keynote address. Just word of warning, don't try to refute anything that he says. <laughs> Professor Call, we are very fortunate to have you at Stanford. We appreciate your tremendous service to the university and to our country, and we are grateful for your generosity in addressing the graduates today. Professor Call. Well, Great to see all of you. Thank, thank you, Mike, for the kind introduction, and good afternoon uh, to my fellow faculty members. 
and most especially to our Stanford International Relations graduates. It's great to see all of you and your families here on this joyful day, and to the, da and to the dads out there in the audience, happy Father's Day. Uh, all graduations are special, a time to reflect on your time here at Stanford, all that you've learned, and all the relationships that you've built with your fellow students, with your teachers, and with others. But it's particularly special for me to be able to address this group of graduating students because you are my people. You are my tribe. Your IR nerds. When I look out at you, I see a reflection of myself as a graduating senior three decades ago. That was a long time. Now, it's true, although I grew up right across the bay in Richmond, I never managed to get into Stanford. In fact, I didn't even manage to get into Cal. But as an undergraduate, I too was passionate about international relations, and those passions drove me towards a career as an academic and policymaker focused on national security and foreign policy. It's what brought me back to the Bay Area after so many years in Washington, D.C. to work at Stanford alongside my amazing colleagues at CSAC and the Freeman Spogli Institute. And it's why I was so thrilled when Professor Toms asked me to speak to you all today about these shared passions and how I hope you will channel them in the years and decades ahead to make the better place to make the world a better place, to go forth and to do good things. The headlines that stream across our smartphones and our tablets and our laptops these days are full of international crises. Nuclear disputes with Iran and North Korea, trade fights with Mexico and China, warnings about Russian meddling in our democracy, Brexit. American leadership on the stage is questioned. Our alliances are strained. Our values at home and abroad are under stress, and the international rules, institutions, and organizations that the United States helped build after the Second World War, the backbone of the so-called liberal international order, seem increasingly inadequate to the tasks of our current century. All of this matters a great deal, but none of these daily developments are occurring in a vacuum. There, are, there is a broader context at work, and many of the most important dynamics driving international affairs run below the surface of these headlines. Fortunately, your education in international relations here at Stanford has put you in a position to pierce the veil, to see beyond the headlines and the mass hysteria over the latest presidential tweet. And it is my hope that your time here at Stanford has put you in a position to help us collectively respond to the greatest challenges we face. There are several big trends and drivers shaping the world today that I believe will continue to do so for decades, in fact, arguably for the rest of your lives and your professional careers. So let me say something about four of these trends in particular. Now, to the parents, I, I have to apologize. Uh, this is going to be a bit of the kind of the last lecture for your students. Uh, but frankly, this is what you paid the big bucks for. The first key trend I want to talk about is the intersection of globalization and inequality. The world has seen unprecedented economic expansion since World War II, improving the lives of billions of human beings. The combined de gross domestic product of all the countries in the world has expanded from a little more than $4 trillion after World War II to more than $85 trillion today far outpacing population growth and contributing to rising per capita incomes across the world. More than anything, this growth has been fueled by globalization, an exponential increase in the volume and velocity of services, goods, information, technology, and people crossing borders, integrating, communicating, making things, and doing business. Globalization, which reached new heights after the end of the Cold War, has produced some clear winners, most notably the world's ultra-rich individuals. It has also helped lift hundreds of millions of other people, especially those in emerging countries like China and India, out of poverty and into a burgeoning middle class. But the unfortunate reality is also that a number of others, in particular the very poor around the world and the middle classes in advanced industrial economies, including ours, have been left behind and squeezed as creative destruction, market efficiencies, automation, and trade have displaced jobs, disrupted communities, and produced, in many places, stagnant wages. The result is a mounting global inequality, a rising tide in which too many boats are sinking. 
Consider this one fact. According to the organization Oxfam, in 2017, the eight richest individuals in the world, they all happen to be men, had a combined wealth of $426 billion. Eight people. That's equivalent to the poorest half of all human beings on planet Earth. Startling numbers like that have real consequences. Anxiety and, anxiety and inequality fueled by globalization are a major driver of rising nationalism, populism, and grievance-based politics, both here in the United States and around the world, with profound consequences for domestic and international stability. What's more, we may only be at the front end of the dislocations brought about by globalization and technology. This brings me to the second mega trend shaping this century, your century, the digitization of everything. The rapid growth of computing power in recent decades, the creation and expansion of the internet, and the explosion of mobile communication devices around the world have driven innovation and produced extraordinary efficiencies and conveniences. But these changes have also made our private data vulnerable to exploitation and critical infrastructure vulnerable to crippling cyber attacks. There is no doubt that the miracle of having all of the information rec in recorded history available in your pocket on a supercomputer, well, first of all, it's just cool, but it's done extraordinary things, no doubt. It's also helped to democratize information and empower civil society in ways that can challenge the status quo. But these same technologies and devices have also provided new platforms for demagoguery and disinformation. While the enormous amounts of data we produce about ourselves on a minute-by-minute -minute basis has given corporations and nation states new means of surveillance that threaten our civil liberties, and in some authoritarian countries have eased repression. Moreover, the overwhelming amount of information and the proliferation of media and social media sources has also forced many of us into our own closed networks of trusted voices to manage the flow, resulting in echo chambers for our own beliefs. Depending on what news we read, what, what websites we go to, we almost live in different worlds. And in this ecosystem, it's become increasingly difficult to discern fact from fiction between actual fake news and the news that our politicians tell us is fake because they don't like it. Other dramatic advances in digital technologies are upon us as well, ranging from synthetic biology to 3D printing, the internet of things, machine learning, and quantum computing all of which are likely to profoundly shape our lives for the remainder of this century, and all of which have a hub here at Stanford. Artificial intelligence tops that list. In early September 2017, Russian President Vladimir Putin declared, quote, whoever becomes the leader in artificial intelligence will become the ruler of the world, unquote. Now, to say the least, I don't agree with Putin on very many things, uh, but the guy might actually be onto something here. There is a reason that China has pledged to invest $150 billion on AI by the year 2030. Putin's remarks and China's investments reflect a growing belief that AI will fundamentally reshape the global economy, determine how competitive countries are, and potentially alter the military balance of power as AI transforms everything from intelligence collection to our ability to use swarms of autonomous drones. The biggest consequences, however, are likely to be economic. AI promises to create enormous economic expansion, but a major concern is the possibility that AI will also accelerate inequality as a handful of huge corporations reap enormous benefits and many workers around the world are dislocated by accelerating digitization and automation. A 2017 McKinsey Global Institute report, for example, found a midpoint estimate of 400 million people, or 15% of the global workforce, that are likely to be disrupted by automation before 2030. And PricewaterhouseCooper estimates that it could be 38% of all jobs in the United States by 2030. 38% of all jobs in the United States. This will undoubtedly include many blue collar workers like factory workers and millions of long haul truckers and others displaced by autonomous vehicles. But it'll also include lawyers and stock traders and accountants and medical professionals and other skilled white collar jobs that could become automated by smarter and smarter machines. Look, I recognize where I'm standing, all right? We're in Silicon Valley. This is the fount of techno-optimism, the belief that all disruption in, at some point is inherently good. And I have no doubt that, that 
AI won't just kill jobs, it'll create new ones, it'll create new industries, some we've never even thought about. It's also the case that an AI-fueled economic boom could generate enormous resources for our government to redistribute to those who are left behind. But the scale and speed of possible disruption leads many analysts, including myself, to worry that even if there are aggregate gains in the long term, the transitional challenges and the political challenges could prove overwhelming. Inequality and economic dislocation around the world is also com combining with failed states, civil wars, and environmental degradation to contribute to a third major underlying driver of international affairs, mass migration. According to the United Nations, from 2000 to 2017, the number of international migrants worldwide increased from 173 million to 258 million. Many of them were displaced by civil war, horrific, horrific levels of criminal violence, and environmental disaster. Indeed, in 2018, just last year, the number of internally displaced persons and refugees totaled almost 69 million people, which is the largest number of people in that category since World War II. Most refugees go to neighboring countries, often in, often in the developing world, where they can create enormous humanitarian and economic burdens. Consider a place like Lebanon, before the war in, in, in Syria, Lebanon had a population of 4 million. Now Lebanon has a population of 5.5 million. More than one in five people in Lebanon is a Syrian refugee. Imagine if one in five Americans was suddenly a refugee. As dramatic as statistics like that are, most people on the move are actually not refugees. They are people leaving their countries of origin in search of greater economic opportunity elsewhere and many of them are finding their way to developed regions in Europe, Asia, and North America. As circumstances on our southern border attest, the humanitarian implications can be heartbreaking. The political implications are also significant. Refugees and migration flows from Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia to Europe have clearly contributed to a rising wave of xenophobia, anti-Muslim sentiment, and far-right populism across the European continent. And here in the United States, despite being a nation of immigrants that is clearly capable of absorbing more, surging migration from, the, from Central America is providing opportunities for our own politicians to play out, out on our fears, conjuring up images of invading caravans and marauding criminals crashing across our shores. During my time at the White House, I helped Vice President Biden tackle the surge of unaccompanied minors coming from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras that started to arrive in the summer of 2014. So I know how tough this challenge is. But I also know that racist intolerance, manufactured emergencies, and phony walls are not a real answer to a humanitarian crisis that requires investments in addressing the economic deprivation, corruption, and violent crime that are driving these families to come here in the first place. In the years ahead, we can expect even more people to be on the move because of a fourth, and I would argue, most consequential trend, climate change. Despite the landmark 2015 Paris Climate Accord, global emissions of carbon dioxide and other heat-trapping gases continue to rise. In the coming decades, the resulting increase in global temperatures and changing weather patterns could elevate sea levels, putting billions living in coastal communities around the world at risk and forcing hundreds of millions to leave their homes. Scientists warn that climate change could trigger mass die-offs of coral reefs and other vulnerable plant and animal species, expand zones for infectious disease, infectious disease, worsen water scarcity and food shortages, and contribute to higher incidents of natural disasters like forest fires and increase the frequency of severity and severity of extreme storms. Consider this. On March 14th of this year, a ferocious and uncommonly prolonged cyclone slammed into the African country of Mozambique. Tens of thousands of homes were destroyed by the storm and hundreds of thousands of people were displaced across an area roughly the size of Luxembourg. The flood zone was so large you could see it from outer space. I wrote my dissertation at Columbia on the prospects that extreme environmental stress like climate change could imperil our national security by producing armed conflict throughout the developing world. And as events like this become more common, there is no doubt in my mind that climate change is a national security issue. We're already seeing the signs. Consider this. The day after that huge cyclone hit Mozambique, 
unusually heavy rains pummeled the American Midwest, causing significant flooding. Among the areas that were flooded was, office, was Offutt Air Force Base, the home of U.S. Strategic Command, our nuclear weapons command, and home to more than 10,000 U.S. military personnel. Floodwaters reached up to seven feet deep, forcing one-third of the base to relocate and causing billions of dollars of damage. Right after the storm, a friend of mine, also in the, kind of a national security nerd, reached out to me via email and said, no terrorist in their wildest dreams could cause that much damage to an American military base. So we are already seeing the early indicators of the existential risks climate change could pose and the consequences, uh, and, and scientists believe that, that we ain't seen nothing yet. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, many of the direst consequences of climate change could be upon us as early as 2040, which means when you all are my age, right, which may seem a long time from now, but it's not that long from now, you will be living in a warming, in a warming world and we will need your help to rapidly decarbonize our economy and find more sustainable ways to live. If you are going to bring about positive change in our world, it is imperative to understand how the world works. That is why your focus on international relations during your time here at Stanford is such an inviolable, invaluable asset. Stepping back to look at the big picture, I believe the megatrends I just surveyed are already contributing to and are likely to accelerate important shifts in the underlying structure of the international system and how power is exercised within that system. The things that you have studied in your IR classes, the key actors and the forces at work in our world are rapidly moving targets. To be sure, Westphalian nation states, the building blocks of the modern international system still matter. In fact, if anything, traditional geopolitics is making a bit of a comeback as the global primacy of the United States, which we've enjoyed since the end of the Cold War, is being increasingly challenged by a more assertive Russia and most consequentially a rapidly rising China. Consider the fact that by some measures, China's economy is already bigger than ours. And by any measure, the total size of China's economy will surpass ours in the next decade. Meanwhile, China is modernizing its military, advancing its own international institutions, seeking to establish its own international rules on everything from trade to governing the internet, carving out a sphere of influence in places like the South China Sea, building a network of strategic partnerships around the globe through its Belt and Road Initiative, seeking to dominate technologies of the future like artificial intelligence and robotics, and attempting to prove that its own model of techno-authoritarian capitalism can outshine and outperform the American democratic experiment. So how the United States manages its relationships with Beijing and other major powers in the years ahead will matter a great deal for our prosperity, for our security, and for our way of life. But things are getting even more complicated. Even if states remain crucial players on the world stage, our planet is not just a collection of billiard balls crashing into each other. For one thing, the changing nature of technology in the global economy means that power is not only being more evenly distributed among states, it is increasingly diffused away from states towards non-state actors. Consider the fact that Facebook, which is a little company down the road this way, uh, is a key information platform for 2.27 billion users, or about one-third of all of humanity. That's power. Or consider the fact that Apple, down that way, has $237 billion in the bank right now, which is equivalent to the GDP of Egypt, a country of 80 million people, and is equivalent, it is bigger than the GDP of three-fourths of all countries on the planet. As power diffuses in this way, the scholar Anne-Marie Slaughter has convincingly argued that the world should no longer be viewed as merely a chessboard being played by nations. It is a spider web made up of intersecting networks of all types of relevant public and private actors, from large corporations to terrorist and criminal networks to transnational NGOs. We will need your help figuring out how to play chess and navigate this spider web at the same time. What's more, we will have to grapple with the reality that power in the form of legitimate authority and influence is not only more diffused, it is also breaking down within many countries. At the extreme, of course, this manifests itself in failed states in places like Afghanistan, or Libya, or Yemen, or Somalia. 
But there is also a growing crisis within advanced industrial democracies like our own and among many emerging nations where citizens increasingly believe their leaders and institutions are not responsive, effective, or accountable in the face of rapid economic, cultural, and environmental change. The center of the political spectrum, which has been long dominated, which has long dominated politics in established democracies, has failed to adequately address the disruption and dislocation produced by globalization and technology and the cultural anxieties produced by mass migration. This has produced political openings for more extreme nationalist parties and agendas, often at odds with democratic traditions of openness, tolerance, civility, and inclusivity. As a result, democracy itself seems to be in retreat in many places. Indeed, according to the organization Freedom House, of the 41 countries that were consistently ranked as free from 1985 to 2005, 22 of those 41 countries have registered net declines in freedom in just the last five years. In this rapidly evolving international landscape, we will need you to help us boldly reimagine and reinvigorate our policies and our institutions. My generation and older generations still have enormous burdens to carry, but we can't carry them alone. Your education at Stanford and your time here in the Silicon Valley has exposed you to many of the forces that are shaping this century. Now we need your help to bend these forces towards our common good. If you plan to go and work in the private sector, make sure that those killer apps that you design are not actually killer apps. And make sure that the finance that you help mobilize is for the betterment of society, not just the bottom line of, sh of shareholders. If you become an academic, like me, try to study something important, something timely, something relevant, and resist the ivory tower incentives to remain aloof from the real world. This is something that I've tried to do in my entire career because in the end, nerds like us should be writing things that not only matter up here, but matter out there. If you go to work for a nonprofit or for an international organization, Design practical and innovative solutions to make our economy more environmentally sustainable or to address the daily indignities that so many people around the world still face. Help others grab onto the ladder of opportunity that you take for granted. And if you're considering public service, do it. Do it. Take it from me. Someone who, when I was your age, just wanted to grow up and be a college professor. Actually, the truth is, I applied to 12 graduate schools. I got 10 rejection letters before I got the first acceptance, so I was actually planning on being a high school teacher. But in any case, uh, after getting into Columbia, uh, I then planned to be a, a college professor. I had no intention at all of serving uh, in, in government. But looking back, having spent about half of my professional life since 9-11 in public service, I see it as by far in the way the most rewarding and impactful thing I've ever done. Look, it doesn't matter who the president is, whether you like him or her or like their administration or not. The fact is your country needs you. I was a political appointee in the Obama administration, so my personal politics are not a secret. But my first gig in government was an 18-month stint at the Department of Defense working in the Stability Operations Office in the middle of the George W. Bush administration. Don Rumsfeld was still the Secretary of defense at the Pentagon at that time. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were sliding off the rails. Things were so bad that the 24 of us working in that tiny stability operations office used to joke that the 24 of us did stability operations and the other 24,000 employees working at the Pentagon did instability operations. But the issues that I worked on, including thinking about ways that our military could retool itself where complex contingencies, humanitarian crises, and counterinsurgency operations could not have been more important. Look, when you get past all the daily noise and the conspiracy claims about the deep state, the reality is that most foreign policy is designed and implemented by patriotic public servants, not political folks. Our diplomatic corps, our military, our intelligence, law enforcement, and aid professionals, and so many others. Our country cannot be safe or prosperous or, or free without people willing to serve. So I hope that at least some of you will. 
Look, the world out there is daunting. I've certainly provided a litany of horrors today on this graduation day. But it's also full of incredible promise. And you, as Stanford graduates, are blessed with the skills to make a difference. I have faith in you. I'm excited for you. And I hope that you're excited too. There are so many ways you can make the world better, and we desperately, desperately need you to. So go forth, roll up your sleeves, put your heads together, get to work, and for the sake of all of us, do good things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Call, for that incredibly inspirational speech. I am now delighted to introduce our two student speakers. I'll start with the first student speaker, Audrey Wynn. As, I'm going to introduce you. Uh, <laughs> uh, as an international relations major and a human rights minor, Audrey focused on international refugee policy gender-based violence, and post-conflict reconciliation. She interned at the U.S. Department of Justice, at the office of U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein, at Lawyers for Human Rights in Cape Town, and at the Justice Center Hong Kong. On campus, she was deeply involved with the Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice, and with the Haas Center for Public Service. She also served as co-president of Stanford Women's Coalition and director of the Feminist Narratives Project at the Women's Community Center. Audrey's honors thesis, an investigation of sexual violence during the Vietnam War, won the IR Honors Program Thesis Prize and the Award for Excellence in Honors Thesis Presentation. She also received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and she is graduating with distinction. Next year, Audrey will work in US immigration law and policy as a John Gardner Public Service Fellow. Please join me in welcoming Audrey. When I applied to Stanford in 2014, I wrote my personal statement on the conversations that took place at my family's dinner table. I reflected on the ways in which these conversations instrumentally shaped my worldview and sense of self, and shared my aspirations for the kinds of conversations I would one day have in college. Despite my great ambitions, nothing could have prepared me for the opportunities for conversation I found at Stanford. Never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined that, as an undergraduate, I would sit at a table with a Supreme Court justice a UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, a former director of the CIA, or a senior advisor to a former president of the United States. While 18-year-old Audrey had certainly fantasized about a Monday afternoon I might spend sitting in an oversized armchair across from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, discussing the importance of women's representation on the Supreme Court over a plate of dark chocolate sprinkles cupcakes, no part of me believed that it might actually come true. And yet, there she was, one Monday afternoon, the notorious RBG, an arm's length away, insisting that there will not be enough women on the Supreme Court until there are nine, and reminding us that we must live not for ourselves, but for our communities. These are exactly the kinds of conversations we have all been a part of in our last four years as international relations majors at Stanford, with some of the world's most influential leaders in foreign policy, economics, law, and social justice, as well as some of the most influential future leaders in these fields, each other. One of the first tables I had a seat at during my time at Stanford was Professor Jim Furon's. It was my first day of college, and 16 of us sat around a long rectangular table in a stuffy third floor room in Coverly. Professor Furon mysteriously swirled his coffee mug around in circles, as he does, as we all waited in nervous anticipation. Over the course of 10 weeks, we learned about the phenomenon of civil war through the lens of Syria, an ongoing crisis unfolding before our very eyes. 
our conversations often felt like secret policy conferences, where Professor Furon, one of the most influential international relations scholars of our time, would share his highly coveted insight and policy predictions with all of us as we frantically transcribed his every word and questioned our own preconceived notions about the origins of ethnic conflict. Fast forward to fall quarter of my junior year when I participated in the Stanford and Washington program. By day, my classmates and I interned in the US Congress, the State Department, and leading policy think tanks. By night, we took classes with deputy assistant secretaries of state, world famous journalists, and senior attorneys at the Department of Justice. Many of us stood in the halls of the Senate the day that thousands of dreamers stormed the Capitol to advocate for their rights to an education and citizenship in the US. As a first generation American, I remember looking out at the endless stream of students and feeling as if I could have just as easily been one of them. The morning after the Vegas shooting, I sat in a room with counsels on the Senate Judiciary Minority Committee and watched them fervently negotiate over the content of a new gun control bill in the hopes it might actually pass. And one lucky afternoon, I scored the last seat in the Senate hearing room to watch Attorney General Jeff Sessions testify before Congress regarding Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Keeping a tally in the upper right-hand corner of my notebook, of the number of times he said, I don't recall. Needless to say, some of these opportunities were more inspiring than others. For my IR honors thesis research, I traveled to Vietnam, where I sat across the table from Vietnamese diplomats, prisoners of war, and former communist revolutionaries, as they described their experiences with the US military during the Vietnam War. We must all understand this history, they told me. Only then can we move forward. The opportunity to study abroad as an IR major also took me to Cape Town, South Africa, where I found myself sitting around a massive marble table in the halls of the South African parliament on the day President Jacob Zuma was ousted from office. The cheers that erupted through the building were deafening. While all of these moments have been integral to my understanding of the world and of the people in it, I realize now that I have only been able to make sense of these moments through conversations with all of you, my peers. These are the conversations that have fundamentally shaped who I am today as a scholar, as a leader, and as a human being. The conversations have been in my freshman seminar with Professor Firon, where students from around the world, India, Bahrain, Mexico, Turkey, gather together each week to share a seemingly infinite supply of diverse perspectives on civil war and ethnic conflict. The conversations have been at Stanford and Washington, where my favorite part of every day was dinner in the SIW dining room, surrounded by friends, many of whom are in the audience today. As we discussed our passion for criminal justice reform, memes of Rex Tillerson, and the latest gossip in the Pentagon. The conversations have been in Cape Town, across rickety pool tables at the college dive bars that lined Long Street, where my friends and I learned about the continued legacy of apartheid from local university students as they inquired why American students found it so difficult to talk about race. Here on campus, these conversations have taken place at tables in Wilbur Dining and Coupa and Encina Hall with my fellow IR students, the people I believe will one day become the future directors of the FBI, judges for the International Criminal Court, our next UN Secretary General, and even President of the United States. It is the conversations we have had <clears throat> on everything from the spread of ra radical extremism and nuclear nonproliferation policy to how to meet our applied econ requirement without taking Math 51. <laughs> it is the late nights we've spent wondering about the future of this country and of the world we will leave for generations to come. These conversations are what I will miss most about college. I will miss that no idea has ever been too big or too ambitious for these tables. Over the last four years, the energy and innovation that has sprung from these conversations has restored my faith in this country and in our collective ability to change the world. In a matter of years, I know that you all, the class of 2019, will be sitting at some of the most influential tables in the world. 
we'll be meeting with activists and government officials and community organizers in every corner of the globe. My hope is that we will approach these tables with some of the principles we developed throughout our college years. The optimism and ambition we had as freshmen, the flexibility and open-mindedness we developed as sophomores, the communication skills we honed as juniors, and of course, a healthy dose of pragmatism. Thanks, senior year. I hope we will make space for new ideas and opinions, no matter how different they are from our own. I hope that we will always consider those who are not sitting at the table with us and make every effort to include and elevate their voices. I hope that we will continue to believe in the power we each hold as individuals and remember the tremendous responsibility that comes with it. What a great privilege it has been to have a seat at the table with all of you, to have been given four years of life to think critically about the world around us in the company of the most creative, compassionate, and brilliant thinkers that I know. Congratulations to the class of 2019. Here's to a lifetime of meaningful conversation. Audrey, thank you for that terrific speech. Uh, our second student speaker is Lloyd Lyle. Lloyd is graduating with honors in international relations and minors in economics and political science. He studied abroad in Paris, held summer research positions in Belgium and Cote d'Ivoire, and contributed to reports for the Canadian Parliament and the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. On campus, Lloyd was a Stanford tour guide an international relations peer advisor, and vice president of the Stanford Debate Society. His honors thesis used satellite data and sophisticated statistical methods to evaluate post-conflict reconstruction in Iraq. Lloyd's thesis won the university's Firestone Medal for excellence in undergraduate research. He also received the Alumni Association's award of excellence and is graduating Phi Beta Kappa, Pi Sigma Alpha, and with distinction. Next year, he will return to his home country of Canada to start law school at the University of Toronto. Please join me in welcoming Lloyd to the stage. Fellow graduates, faculty and staff, friends and family, good afternoon. Foreign Policy Magazine says they can teach you everything you'll remember about a BA in international relations in five minutes. Trade is good, norms are constructed, anarchy rules, power talks, and people make mistakes. It's that simple, so is there anything else to it? My best answer is that IR changes the way that we see the world. Here's an example. Any upperclassman at this school can tell you that if you don't enroll in Introduction to Wine Tasting in the first 20 seconds of course enrollment, that course will be full. Most students would agree with me when I say it might be better if we all waited five minutes to enroll in wine tasting and enrolled in the courses we actually need to graduate first. That everybody sitting here can also tell you that although we all know this, no one will wait and everyone will enroll in wine tasting right away. After four years of international relations, we are still complicit in this madness, but now we can tell you why it happens. Your friends can't credibly commit to wait to enroll. Introduction to French verticulture faces a commitment problem. It turns out that as IR majors, we've learned to see this strategic interaction everywhere in everyday life. When people hoard cutlery in their dorm rooms and there's no plates left in the kitchen, we see a strategy of the commons. When the Daily and the Review engage in op-ed wars, we see a security dilemma. When your friend and their crush are both playing hard to get, we tell them they're in a coordination dilemma and their love is kind of like a stag hunt. And when a political science major asks us why our major is different from the international relations political science track, 
we explain to them the difference between monopoly money and real money. <laughs> There's no doubt that being an IR major gives us the verbiage to describe ordinary things in complicated ways. But maybe one of the best things we take from this major is the reverse. We learn to describe complicated things simply. The Kyoto Protocol and the lack of clean plates in row houses could not be more different problems, but they're both driven by the same core incentives. Nobody wants to clean up a common mess on their own. We're never going to learn every nuance of every future puzzle. We often don't even know what tools we'll have to work with. So instead, we're learning to simplify complexity. IR is teaching us to distill common patterns from the world that we observe and apply them to new scenarios we've never seen before. We're learning to find the familiar in the unknown and use it to shape our approach to problems that we have never seen. I think IR is as much process as it is knowledge. It's learning how to tinker with the machinery that drives strategic choices in an uncertain world. It's a good time to be trained to solve from common foundations because the world we enter is as complicated and problematic as ever. From the Islamic State to Ebola, from Rakhine State to Sinjar, from refugees to terrorism, fake news, and climate change, the international quality of today's crises is striking. The breadth of solutions required is terrifying. And in the face of this challenge, it's easy to look at this scene and feel defeated. But IR majors don't give up that easily, and I say this from experience because our class is already fighting back. We are industrious global workers. There are graduates here today who have interned on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee or in the State Department, at the American embassies in Prague and Seoul, at the Brookings Doha Center, and at the United Nations in Geneva. We're assiduous researchers. Graduates sitting in this crowd have worked under former national security advisors and secretaries of state, key professors and top political figures and ambassadors. Here today is somebody who conducted field work in Vietnam on the legacy of the Vietnam War, and somebody who scoured the Berlin archives to uh, understand the history of Sino-German military cooperation. There are graduates here today who have interviewed Aboriginal leaders in Alaska, Rohingya representatives from Myanmar, and American presidential candidates. And we're dynamic and interesting humans outside of academics. Sitting here today is a Stanford class president, a tour guide manager, a certified scuba diver, and a pentalingual. There are also a cappella singers, freshman RAs, and a future Philadelphia Eagles receiver. So what unites the vastly diverse class behind us? We do a forest of different things, but we bring a similar toolbox to all of them. We're the pattern finders and the problem solvers. Here's an example. The Stanford Men's Conference convenes young leaders from around the Middle East and North Africa to under, uh, address understanding and progress every year. When shifts in immigration policy made it unclear whether some of these people could come to Stanford, one of the graduates sitting here today helped move that conference to Oxford so that it could go ahead. It's one of the many examples of how this class has solved problems. Graduates here today have organized voter registration campaigns, they've rallied students to protests, and worked on the front lines of social justice initiatives around the world. So my answer to foreign policy is both yes and no. Yes, we can distill the core of our degree in five minutes, but our ability to extract that clarity and act on it are the skills that take years to learn. As puzzle solvers in a complex world, I hope that we stay ambitious and tenacious. But I also hope that we remember to balance our ambition by taking time to do the things we love and spending time with the people who are important to us. I hope we judge ourselves by what we do, not how we're recognized. And remember that sometimes making the biggest impact means letting somebody else be in the spotlight. I hope we remember that good leadership often requires compromise, sacrifice, realistic planning, and hard work. And that sometimes this means we have to give up our dream vision to come up with something that works. I also hope we remember we don't have to do everything. Do what you love and do it well. After today, some of us are off to work in NGOs and government and the private sector, others to graduate or professional school. Wherever we're going next, one of the great strengths of being a Stanford IR grad is that we can count on each other to be friends, advisors, and confiance. 
I think we have a lot of work still to do, and I think we'll be far better at it if we do it together. As a class, we owe a great debt to our professors, administrators, and the school, as well as the friends and family who have supported us over our undergraduate careers. In particular today, I'd like to recognize Professor Toms, who steps down after seven years directing our program. And I want to leave us today with a comment on who we find patterns and solve puzzles with. There are a great many brilliant people in the world who do not have Stanford degrees. Not because they're not smart, but because the circumstances of their lives made it impossible, or because they simply chose not to. I hope that we open ourselves to passionate people with brilliant ideas, no matter who they are or where they come from, and that we weld our degrees not as crowns of intelligence, but as toolkits to help us and those around us create change in an uncertain world. It is a tremendous privilege to hold a Stanford IR degree. Our job now is to bring honor to that privilege. Friends, best of luck. Dads, happy Father's Day to all. Congratulations. Lloyd, thank you so much for those terrific remarks. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the awarding of the diplomas. Three of my colleagues, Drs. Erica Gould, Robert Rakove, and Steve Stedman, will assist with the diploma ceremony. Allow me to introduce them briefly. Dr. Erica Gould is a lecturer in international relations and the director of our honors program. She teaches courses on thesis writing, international political economy, and international organizations. She received her BA from Cornell University and her PhD in political science from Stanford. Dr. Gould is the author of Money Talks, The International Monetary Fund, Conditionality, and Supplementary Financiers. She has also published numerous academic articles, and she serves on the board of Accountability Council an international NGO based in San Francisco. Before joining our program at Stanford, Dr. Gould taught at the University of Virginia and at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Robert Rakove is a lecturer in international relations. He received his doctorate in US history from the University of Virginia, but he is also a proud cardinal. Having received his bachelor's in political science from Stanford in 1999, and his master's in 2000. Dr. Rakove is the author of Kennedy, Johnson, and the Non-Aligned World, a history of US policy toward the third world in the early and mid 1960s. His current research concerns US-Afghan relations in the decade after the Soviet invasion. He has previously held fellowships at the University of Virginia, the Ohio State University, the University of Sydney, and the Hoover Institution. I'm also delighted to introduce Professor Steven Stedman, who will be handing out the diplomas today. Professor Stedman is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, a professor by courtesy of political science at Stanford, and deputy director of Stanford Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. This past year, Professor Stedman chaired the university's faculty senate. Professor Stedman plays a central role in international education here at Stanford. He teaches classes on international security and directs the CDDRL Honors Program. He has taught at Stanford's abroad program in Cape Town and traveled with students to Europe to study the origins of World War I. Back on campus, Dr. Stedman and his wife, Corinne Thomas, are resident fellows and Carruthers, Stanford's academic theme house on global citizenship. In 2018, Professor Stedman won the Lloyd B. Dinkelspiel Award, which is Stanford's highest honor for service to undergraduate education. Finally, Dr. Stedman has an incredible record of international public service. From 2003 to 2004, he served as research director for the UN High-Level Panel on Threats, Challenges, and Change. In 2005, 
He was the Assistant Secretary General and Special Advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations. From 2010 to 2012, he chaired the Global Commission on Elections, Democracy and Security, an international body to promote and protect the integrity of elections worldwide. And now, he is serving as Secretary General of the Kofi Annan Commission on Elections and Democracy in the Digital Age, which examines how social media affects the integrity of elections. Professor Stedman not only works at Stanford, he also received his BA, his MA, and his PhD degrees from Stanford, so I think it's pretty obvious that he loves the farm. Professor Stedman, we are honored to have you here today, and we are delighted that you will be helping us by awarding the diplomas. Now, finally, I'd like to recognize and thank several colleagues who have joined us on the stage for today's ceremony. They include Professors Jasmina Boich, Bert Patnod, Gilly Vardy, our dynamic associate director, Dr. Paul Festa, and our wonderful program manager, Jessica Michael. Thanks to all of you for your help with today. The diploma ceremony will proceed as follows. Drs. Gould and Rakoff will read the graduates' names and brief biographies. Graduates, as your names are called, please come on stage to my right. Professor Stedman will hand you your diploma. Professor Call will congratulate you, and I will provide a final handshake. You will exit to my left here and uh, return to your seat. To help the ceremony go smoothly, I would ask everyone to please hold your applause until all the graduates have received their degrees. At that time, I will invite everyone to congratulate the class of 2019. Now, uh, one last detail about photos. Parents, of course, you are welcome to take photos. If you would like some close-ups of your graduate, please make your way to the front when your son or daughter is about to be called. Graduates, a professional photographer will be taking pictures. If you fill out the card at your seat, I know some of you have already, the photographer will send an email with a link to your proofs. And now I will give the podium to Drs. Gould and Raykov, who will begin reading the names of our graduates. Professor Stedman, could you please come forward to hand the students their degrees? And Professor Call, could you please join me in the receiving line, just as a reminder, please hold your applause until the end of the ceremony. Martin B. Aduma is from Iloilo City, Philippines. He loves simulation classes, learned French, and studied abroad in Paris. He is a Gates Millennium Scholar and a leadership enterprise for a diverse America scholar. Martin worked as a blockchain research assistant and a project manager, and after graduation, will begin a career in technology. Caitlin Claire Albertoli is from San Clemente, California. She studied Spanish and minored in psychology. She is the CEO of the Governor's Corner Dining Society's nonprofit and of her own company, Buzz Solutions, which provides software analytics for power line inspections to reduce wildfires. After graduation, Caitlin looks forward to running her company full-time. Jennifer Nicole Ampey is from Rockville, Maryland. She learned Spanish and studied abroad in Santiago. She was a Haas Center Peer Advisor, the co-president of Stanford Mental Health Outreach, a recipient of the Haas Center Walk the Talk Service Leadership Award, and Alumni Association Award of Excellence, and a member of the Stanford Women Rug Women's Rugby Team. After graduation, Jennifer plans to pursue a dual degree in law and journalism and advocate for the ethical treatment of human rights violation survivors. Grace Lois Anderson is from Boston, Massachusetts. She specialized in international security and studied abroad in Florence, attended Stanford in Washington, and minored in Italian. She was director of marketing for Stanford in government, a student intern in the office of Condoleezza Rice, and a member of the Alpha Phi sorority. She received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and is graduating with IR Honors. A recipient of the Tom Ford Fellowship in Philanthropy through the Haas Center, Grace will receive an 11-month placement at a U.S. foundation after graduation. Allison Louise Anglin is from New York City. She learned Spanish, studied abroad in Madrid, was the Stanford Concert Network Director, and a Stanford Warner Musical Fellow. 
As a Chapel Luigi scholar, she directed an award-winning ecotourism documentary set in Costa Rica that was selected for the Barcelona Environmental International Film Festival. After graduation, Allison aims to become a leader in the global entertainment industry. Sean William Barton is from North Salt, Lake, North Salt Lake, Utah. He specialized in international security, learned French, studied with Professor Condoleezza Rice, was a linebacker on the Stanford football team, a member of the National Football Foundation's Hampshire Honor Society, and twice selected to the Pac-12 football all-academic second team. After graduation, Sean plans to pursue an MBA. Taylor McKenna Butsey is from Shaker Heights, Ohio. She specialized in comparative international governance, learned French and Spanish, studied abroad in Santiago and Paris, and minored in modern languages. She was a Stanford Dolly with the University Marching Band and on the executive board of Chi Omega. After graduation, Taylor plans to pursue a master's degree in applied economics and a career in Washington, DC. Tinuala Dada is from Sammamish, Washington. She specialized in Africa, learned Arabic, French, and Spanish, studied abroad in Cape Town, and minored in modern languages. She was a director with Stanford in Government, a founding member of Stanford's Prison Renaissance Project, co-chair of Stanford Women in Politics, and senior editor at Static, a Stanford activist's website. She received a Stanford in Government Fellowship and was four-time recipient of the Black Community Dean's Award. After graduation, she plans to attend law school and pursue a career in international human rights or civil rights law. Rand Summerlin Duarte is from Leonardtown, Maryland. She learned Spanish and Arabic and studied abroad in Chile, attended Stanford and Washington, completed internships at the Pentagon and State Department, was a member of Stanford in Government and Stanford United Students for Veterans Health, and was captain of the intramural sand volleyball team. She was research assistant for General H.R. McMaster and for the Mapping Militants Project and received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence. After graduation, Rand will work as a government analyst in Washington, D.C. Nala Gideon Achi is from Marybelle, France. She studied abroad in Australia and Cape Town and completed minors in human biology and human rights. She was president of the Stanford Club swim team and a member of Stanford climbing team and Stanford Club water polo. She worked as a research assistant at the Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions and interned at emergency first aid responders in Cape Town. After graduation, Nala will work at the Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions and complete a coterminal master's degree in Earth Systems with the goal of working at the intersection of human rights and environmental issues on international waters. Nita Gegashidze is from Tbilisi, Georgia. She specialized in international security, speaks Russian, German, and French, and this autumn will study abroad in Paris. She was a member of Stanford Women in Politics and the American Middle Eastern Network for Dialogue. She was a Stanford and Government Fellow in Hong Kong and the Freeman Spogli Institute Europe Center Fellow in Brussels. After graduation, Nita will work in Georgia before returning to the United States to pursue a master's in public policy. Megan Haynes is from Carlsbad, California. She specialized in international security, learned French and German, studied abroad in Paris, worked as a research assistant at the Hoover Institution, was a member of Stanford in government, and completed an honors thesis in the Center for International Security and Cooperation. She is graduating Pi Delta Phi and with distinction. After graduation, Megan plans to work in national security and attend law school. Christina Harris is from Port Orange, Florida. She specialized in Latin American and Iberian studies, learned Spanish and Portuguese, and studied abroad in Santiago and Madrid. She worked as a Freeman Spogli Institute global policy intern and through the Haas Center for Public Service as a peer advisor and Ravenswood Reads, uh, Ravenswood Reads tutor. After graduation, Kristen will be a research fellow for the American Voices Project. Jet Karina Hayward is from Santa Clara, California. She specialized in Africa, learned French, and studied abroad in Paris. She did Stanford Quarter internships in Botswana and Bosnia-Herzegovina and served as associate producer with the Stanford Storytelling Project. She was president of Stanford Women's Rugby and a Women's Rugby Collegiate All-American. She received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and is graduating with distinction. After graduation, Jet plans to attend law school and worked with conflict-affected populations. Tashrima Hossein is from Houston, Texas. She specialized in Africa, studied abroad in Cape Town, and completed a minor in Spanish. She was senior class president, co-president of Stanford Women in Business, and financial manager of Jerry House. 
She received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and is graduating with IR honors and with distinction. After graduation, Tashrima will work in investment banking at JP Morgan in New York and plans to attend law school and pursue a career in civil impact law. Audrey Wynn is from Charlotte, North Carolina. She learned Spanish and Arabic, studied abroad in Cape Town, attended Stanford and Washington, and completed a minor in human rights. She was co-president of Stanford Women's Coalition, Feminist Narratives Coordinator at the Stanford Women's Community Center, Director of Fellowships for Stanford and Government, and a recipient of Alumni Association Award of Excellence and Stanford Woman of Impact Awards. She is graduating with distinction and IR honors and has been awarded the IR Honors Program Thesis Prize and the Award for Excellence in Honors Thesis Presentation. After graduation, Audrey will work in US Immigration Law and Policy as a John Gardner Public Service Fellow. Catherine Irajpana is from Los Angeles, California. She specialized in international security, learned Spanish, and studied abroad in Madrid. She completed an honors thesis in the Center for International Security and Cooperation, was co-founder of the Stanford Non-Proliferation Activism Project, and served as an IR program peer advisor. Catherine is graduating Phi Beta Kappa and Pi Sigma Alpha and with distinction. After graduation, Catherine will pursue a PhD in government at Harvard. Nicole, Nicole Mary Jacobson is from Ann Arbor, Michigan. She specialized in Africa, learned Spanish, studied overseas in Madrid, attended Stanford in New York, completed a human rights internship in Buenos Aires through the Freeman Spogli Institute, and minored in human rights. She received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and, through the Haas Center for Public Service, was an Education Partnership Fellow of the Ravenswood Reads Program, a member of the Public Service Honor Society, and a Walk the Talk Service Awardee. After graduation, Nicole will be a Princeton in Latin America Fellow at an, educa at an education NGO in the Dominican Republic and plans to pursue a career focused on promoting women's equality in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Hannah Capassi is from San Antonio, Texas. She learned Spanish, studied abroad in Santiago, attended Stanford in Washington, and minored in economics. She was president of Stanford Society for International Affairs, student manager and tour guide at the Stanford Visitor Center, received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence, and is graduating with IR honors. After graduation, Hannah will work as a program analyst at the Analysis Group in New York City. Alexandra Marie Kelly is from San Diego, California. She specialized in international security, studied abroad in Madrid, completed a second major in history, and minored in Spanish. She interned with Make-A-Wish, the Stanford Center on Global Poverty and Development, and the Department of Justice. After graduation, Alexandra will attend Boston College Law School while continuing to pursue her interest in national security. Irene Kim is from Los Angeles, California. She learned Spanish, studied abroad in Madrid, and completed an honors thesis in the Center for International Security and Cooperation. She was the director of state and local fellowships for Stanford in government, an intern with the US State Department Foreign Service Program, and a project lead for development solutions organization. Irene received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and is graduating Phi Beta Kappa with IR honors and with distinction. After graduation, she will work as a legal analyst at Cobra and Kim in Washington, DC. Kyle Kinney is from Scottsdale, Arizona. He learned Chinese, Spanish, and German, studied abroad in Berlin, and completed a minor in German studies. He was a Hoover Institution undergraduate council member, as well as a member of the Stanford men's rugby team and Delta Tau Delta fraternity. He is graduating with IR honors and received an IR honors program thesis prize. After graduation, Kyle plans to complete a master's degree and pursue a career in Washington, DC. Ayano Kitano is from Tokyo, Japan. She learned German and French, studied abroad in Berlin, minored in German studies, and completed an honors thesis in the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. She was a research assistant at the Asia Pacific Research Center and the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law a member of the Stanford Nonproliferation Activism Project, and an academic theme associate for Crothers Global Citizenship. Ayano is graduating Phi Beta Kappa and with distinction. After graduation, she will attend Stanford, sorry, she will attend Harvard Law School. I make this slip every time. Um, Ravine Lashlin Kumara Singer is from London, United Kingdom. He learned, I'm going to list these here, 
uh, Chinese, Arabic, Japanese, Russian, French, Spanish, and German. Maybe some others too, I, I won't test to that. Studied abroad in Chile, Japan, and Russia. Completed internships in China and Jordan, and minored in modern languages. He is a member of Dobro Slovo, the Slavic National Honor Society, and a recipient of the Craig and Susan McCaw Stanford Scholarship for International Students. After graduation, Ravine will work for the Japanese government in Hiroshima and in their International Affairs and Peace Promotion Department. Rebecca Nicole Lameca is from McHenry, Illinois. She specialized in international security, learned Spanish, and studied abroad in Madrid. She was a member of Students Against Militarism and a volunteer at the Women for Africa Foundation in Madrid. After graduation, Rebecca will work as a business consultant for Oracle and intends to pursue a career in law or organizational management. Winnie Lee is from Lacey, Washington. She learned Korean and German, studied abroad in Berlin, was a research intern at the Technical University of Berlin, and a Global Studies Project Coordinator at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. After graduation, Winnie plans to work for an NGO or in public service. Siobhan Logan is from Palo Alto, California. She learned Arabic, Hebrew, and Spanish, studied abroad at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, minored in Middle Eastern languages, literature, and culture, and completed an honors thesis in the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. She was a member of Stanford in Government, Tri Delta, the Public Service Honor Society, and is graduating with a Cardinal Service Notation in recognition of her commitment to public service. After graduation, Siobhan will study Arabic in Amman, Jordan before attending graduate school. Elena Diana Diane Lund is from Los Angeles, California. She specialized in international security, learned Spanish and Portuguese, studied abroad in Madrid, completed a minor in psychology, and is graduating with IR honors. She participated in the Summer Research College and was a member of the Stanford Women's Coalition and worked as a tutor coordinator for East Palo Alto Tennis and Tutoring. After graduation, Elena will work as a senior research associate on a 2020 presidential campaign. Lloyd Aaron Lyle is from Vancouver, Canada. He learned French, studied abroad in Paris, conducted field research in Côte d'Ivoire for the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and minored in economics and political science. He was vice president of the Stanford Debate Society and first ever student organizer of the U.S. University's debating championships. He received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and is graduating Pi Sigma Alpha and Phi Beta Kappa and with distinction. He is also graduating with IR Honors and for his honors thesis has been awarded the Firestone Medal for Excellence in Undergraduate Research. After graduation, Lloyd will attend law school at the University of Toronto. Lisa Mossick McPhee is from Encinitas, California. She specialized in Latin American and Iberian studies, learned Spanish and Arabic, studied overseas in Santiago, and attended Stanford in Washington. She interned as a Freeman's Bogley Institute Fellow at the Institute for Economics and Peace in Sydney and was a studio lead with Design for America. After graduation, Lisa plans to undertake research and policy advocacy work in Washington, D.C. to promote human rights, peace, and development around the world. Jacqueline Mesa Tapia is from San Diego, California. She specialized in Latin American and Iberian studies and world economy, studied overseas in Oviedo, Oviedo, Spain, and minored in Spanish. She was president of the U.S. Mex Focus Student Initiative and a member of the Sigma Delta Pi Hispanic Honor Society. After graduation, Jacqueline plans to obtain an MBA and pursue a career in international business. Renata Marguerite Miller is from New York City. 
She specialized in international history and culture, learned Spanish, French, and Portuguese, studied overseas in Paris, attended Stanford in Washington, and graduated with IR honors. She was public relations director for the US Mex Focus Student Initiative, a sophomore college French immersion assistant, and a Ravenswood Reads volunteer. After graduation, Renata will be a Fulbright English teaching assistant in Brazil and hopes eventually to work on Capitol Hill. Kailana Mueller Shaw is from Flagstaff, Arizona. She specialized in international security, learned French, Arabic, and Indonesian, studied overseas in Paris, minored in political science, and completed an honors thesis in the Center for International Security and Cooperation. She was president of the American Middle Eastern Network for Dialogue at Stanford and editor-in-chief of the Stanford's, Stanford's Women's Coalition publication. After graduation, Kailana will be a technology and innovation analyst and Haas Community Impact Fellow at the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation in San Jose. Stephen Newman is from Sunnyvale, California. He specialized in Europe and Russia, learned French, Italian, Spanish, Russian, Bulgarian, and Polish, minored in modern languages, interned with the State Department in Bulgaria, and studied overseas in Paris and Krakow. He was trumpet section leader for the Wind Symphony, participated in the Stanford Collaborative Orchestra, and is a member of Dobro Slovo, the Slavic National Honor Society. After graduation, Stephen will pursue a master's degree at Stanford in Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies. Elaf Osman is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She specialized in the Middle East and Central Asia and studied abroad in Florence. She was the editor-in-chief of Mint Magazine, the social justice director for the Muslim community, and an ASSU senator. She received the Academic Award of Excellence from the Black Community Services Center. After graduation, Elaf plans to pursue medical school and focus on global health efforts in Sudan. Anya Peterson is from Hong Kong. She learned German and Mandarin, studied overseas in St. Petersburg, minored in human rights, and is graduating Pi Sigma Alpha. She participated in the Hoover Institution National Security Affairs Fellows Mentorship Program, was a Stanford in Government Draper Hills Fellow, and a member of the Stanford Ski Team. After graduation, Anya will work in finance and plans to pursue law. Lee Pomerantz is from San Francisco, California. She specialized in Africa, learned Spanish and Swahili, studied overseas in Madrid, and completed minors in human rights and modern languages. She was a helper fellow at CARE International in Timor-Leste, a Cardinal Quarter Fellow at CARE Enterprises, and a legislative intern in the office of Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. She received an Alumni Association Award of Excellence and is graduating Phi Beta Kappa and with distinction. After graduation, Lee plans to pursue a career in global development with a focus on women's empowerment and girls' education. Kit Ramgopal is from Southampton, New York. She specialized in international security, learned Arabic, Spanish, and German, and studied abroad in Berlin. She was managing sports editor for the Stanford Daily, financial director of the American Middle Eastern Network for Dialogue, and an intern at CNBC. She received the Booth Prize for Excellence in Writing, the Julius Jacobs Journalism Award, and the ID House Youth Delegate Fellowship. She is graduating Phi Beta Kappa and with distinction. After graduation, Kit will join NBC's investigative unit in New York City. Aidan McKillian Salomon is from North Caldwell, New Jersey. He specialized in the Middle East and Central Asia, learned Arabic and Latin, studied abroad in Jordan and Oxford, 
and participated in the Stanford and Washington program. He was on the executive board of Kappa Sigma Fraternity, a member of the Stanford Women in Business Ally Program, and a research assistant at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. After graduation, Aidan will move to Beirut and hone his Arabic. Kanani Sophia Schneider is from Accord, New York. She learned German and Hawaiian, studied abroad in Berlin, minored in German studies, and is graduating with IR honors. She was an immigration and asylum law intern, a Camp Kesem Stanford counselor, and a member of the Polynesian dance team. After graduation, Kanani will intern at the, at the Tuong Slang, the, the Tuol Slang Genocide Museum in Cambodia and work in the nonprofit sector prior to attending law school and pursuing international human rights law. Sandra Isabel Scott is from Newport Ritchie, Florida. She learned Spanish, studied abroad at Oxford, participated in the Stanford in New York program, and double majored in psychology. She was the co president of Derechos, an intern for the New York City Commission on Human Rights, a Spanish legal translator at the Stanford Law School Immigration Clinic, and a research assistant at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. After graduation, Sandra will attend Harvard Law School. Elizabeth Sinclair Schneider is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She learned Arabic and Spanish, studied abroad in Morocco, attended Stanford in Washington, and completed an honors thesis at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. She was a member of the Stanford Mixed Company a cappella group, interned at the State Department, and worked as a research assistant at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. She is graduating Phi Beta Kappa and with distinction. After graduation, Elizabeth will join the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations as a junior professional staff member. Laurel Gabriella Sim is from Los Angeles, California. She specialized in international security and world economy, learned Korean and Italian, studied abroad in Florence, and double majored in sociology. She was senior vice president of Stanford Women in Business, vice president of business development for the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students, and interned for venture capital firms and consumer startups. After graduation, Laurel will work at a strategy firm for direct-to-consumer brands. Bakari Smith is from San Francisco, California. He specialized in East and South Asia, learned Mandarin, studied abroad in Beijing, and double majored in East Asian studies. He interned in Beijing, San Francisco, Shanghai, and New York, and was a member of the junior and senior class cabinets. He received the Jackie Robinson Foundation Scholarship, Xizing China Fellowship, and the Alumni Association Award of Excellence. After graduation, Bakari will work as a business associate at Visa in San Francisco and plans to pursue a master's in international relations or an MBA. Claire Smith is from Ottawa, Canada. She studied French and minored in communication. She was on the varsity women's cross country and track and field teams and was a Pac-12 all academic second team. She served as financial officer for the Stanford Happiness Collective and deputy prime minister of the Stanford Canadian Club. She received the Cardinal Club Endowment Award the Longville H. and Marjorie Price Scholarship, the Albert T. Cook Scholarship, the Leon G. Campbell Athletic Scholarship, and the Lucille and Jim Caton Scholarship. After graduation, Claire will pursue a master's degree in global governance and diplomacy at Oxford. Megan Mary Fate Sullivan is from Anchorage, Alaska. She specialized in international security learned Italian and Spanish, and studied abroad in Florence. She interned at NBC News, was involved in Stanford's Pulse magazine, and is graduating with IR honors. 
After graduation, Megan will begin Stanford's co-terminal master's program in sustainability science and practice and pursue a career in journalism or law. Laura Sussman is from Los Angeles, California. She specialized in international history and culture, studied overseas in Paris, learned Italian, and minored in French. She was managing editor at the Stanford Daily, research intern at an international think tank in Brussels, and a member of the French honor society, Pi Delta Phi. After graduation, Laura will attend Columbia University to pursue master's degrees in European history, politics, and society, and in journalism. Gabriela Torres Lorenzati is from Brooklyn, New York. She learned Spanish, studied abroad in Cape Town, attended Stanford in Washington, minored in human rights, and completed an honors thesis in the Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. She was co-president of the Stanford Women's Coalition, co-head teaching assistant for an intergroup communications course, a member of the Public Service Honor Society, and research assistant at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. She received the Hofer Prize for writing in the major, an Alumni Association Award of Excellence, and is graduating Phi Beta Kappa and with distinction. After graduation, Gabriela will teach university-level international relations and law courses in Madrid as a Fulbright English teaching assistant. Kyle Alexander Van Rensselaer is from Auburn, California. He learned Spanish and French, studied abroad in Madrid, and minored in chemistry. He was a member of the Public Service Honor Society, a summer fellow at the California Department of Conservation, and historian of Alpha Chi Sigma Chemistry Fraternity. After graduation, Kyle will intern in Geneva at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and in autumn, begin Stanford's Four Dorsey Masters in International Policy program. Corrie Ray Wieland is from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She specialized in East and South Asia, learned Korean, German, Japanese, and Spanish, and interned with the State Department in South Korea. A Bing Overseas Studies Program student ambassador, she studied abroad in J Japan, Germany, and England. She received the Stanford Cap and Gown Leadership Award, the Alumni Association Award of Excellence, and is graduating with distinction. After graduation, Corrie will begin Stanford's Four Dorsey Masters in International Program and plans to pursue a career in foreign service. Mackenzie Catherine Wiley is from Coronado, California. She specialized in global health, education, and human rights, learned Spanish, and will study abroad this summer in Santiago. She played varsity water polo, was a member of Kappa Alpha Theta, and served as ambassador of the Rubenstein Bing Student Athlete Civic Engagement Program. Mackenzie plans to attend graduate school overseas. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Festa. I'm the associate director of the IR program. This is Jessica Michael, the IR program student services officer. As Lyle has already noted, Professor Toms has served as IR program director for the last seven years and is now passing the director's baton to his colleague, Professor Ken Schultz. On behalf of the IR students, our instructors, and administrative team, I wish to extend to Professor Toms a heartfelt thank you for his tireless dedication, inspiring leadership, and formidable wisdom and expertise. 
As a token of our deep appreciation, we would like to present to Professor Toms a photo signed by students and staff that we hope portrays a sense of what he has meant to the IR program. Thank you so much for that uh, gift and for the special four years that we've shared together as you've been international relations majors. Um, graduates, now that you've received your degrees, please take this opportunity to thank your parents, relatives, and friends for their support. And because we can't celebrate this day enough, uh, I would say, I will ask everyone to please join me in one more hearty round of applause for the class of 2019. This brings our ceremony to an end. Congratulations to all of you, and please enjoy the rest of this festive day. Thank you.